Okay, so um, we wanted to um, introduce our next presenter. Um, so, Mesresha, um, are you um, are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Okay, welcome. So we'll turn it over to Mesresha to to start us off with our first uh, presentation in the second hour. So can you see my screen? Nope, not yet. Okay. Do you see the green share button at the bottom? Yeah. You just press that. There you go. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Masrasha Andarge. I'm from Ethiopia. I'm the co-founder and former executive director of a national NGO called ISTA, Action for Integrated Sustainable Development Association. I'm currently serving as program advisor for the organization. And the topic of uh, the, the title of my chapter is Ensuring Long-Term Project Sustainability a partnership model of ISTA Ethiopia. So this is the logo of my organization. So when we talk about sustainability, there are lots of challenges related to it in terms of sustaining the, the project implementation and the results out of that project. So what happens when the NGOs leave is the main important question that we are going to discuss in this, in this presentation. So what happens is communities don't own or own uh, communities don't they do not have the ownership over the project because uh, something has missed between implementing the project from the beginning where the implementing organization didn't have much time or give any emphasis on sustainability. Due to that, many projects fail and it becomes a waste of resources and it becomes sometimes a reason for a conflict between communities. So sustainability is a challenge for many NGOs, especially in parts of Africa. So what, what do I mean researchers and writers amplify about sustainability and its challenges? When it comes to the, the definition of sustainability, it's about the probability that projects are continued long after the uh, withdrawal of the partner in that particular area. Some others also, sorry, some, about, some also talk about the challenges of sustaining services. Uh, significant number of projects fail because of that. And also the role of government and NGOs is also amplified a lot because government has the, the, the biggest responsibility in, in bringing social changes in the communities and NGOs as gap fee pillars. And the other literature that I have read and uh, got a point from is the challenge of sustainability of projects uh, comes from the difficulties of managing people, designing projects and processing uh, the problem of processes during the implementation period. For those of you uh, who have little knowledge about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is in the eastern part of Africa, bordered with Sudan. Over here from the cursor, you can see the South Sudan, Kenya, Somalia, in the eastern part, Djibouti, and in the northern part, Eritrea. So Ethiopia is the second populated country in Africa next to Nigeria. Ethiopia has got uh, given its uh, large number of population, we have only 3,500 CSOs and NGOs, according to the uh, 2020 report from the USAID. Uh, when we compared we, when we compared this with the number of uh, NGOs and CSOs in our neighboring country, Kenya, which has uh, more than 30,000 CSOs and NGOs combined, it's very low. So one of the reasons that is mentioned for this is the 2009 law 
produced by the government to restrict NGOs not to intervene on human rights, peace building, advocacy, and everything. So 2019, the government produced a new law which gave a space for NGOs and CSOs to work on that. Still, the number is low. So ISTA is an NGO established formally uh, in August 2006. We are operating in the eastern part of Ethiopia, in the dryland pastoralist communities of Ethiopia. Uh, we have intervention in WASH. Currently, we are working on solarizing uh, boreholes and hand pumps. We have a gender-based uh, violence project. We have livelihoods projects, peace building, human rights, and humanitarian programs. We have partnered with, or we are now still partnered with some of these organizations, DSCID, DF, GIZ, WHH, the two are German organizations, IRC, Mercy Corps, and so on. ISDA is a winner of the International Impact Award in 2012. So ISDA, uh, we have a lesson from our failures. We had partial failures in our projects when we began the organization until we developed this multi-stakeholder partnership and collaboration model, which which focuses on bringing in these four partners, especially the community and the government. The community are, communities are the main clients who use the outcomes at the end of the day, and the government is the one that's powerful and that should also institutionalize our projects and, uh, at, the, at the end of the project. And the donor is the one that funds these this projects, and ISDA is the one working between the donor and the community and the government. So what are the lessons that we have learned from, from these projects? The first one is engaging local partner is, partners is very important. Who are these local partners? The first one is the community members. Depending on the nature and type of project, we have to engage women, the youth, community uh, 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 men and women, and also opinion leaders that are very influential in the communities. We have to also work with the, the local government, which is also very important in this part because it's possible to use, the, use their uh, expertise in different aspects because, the, because of uh, the funding uh, shortages, we cannot employ for many positions that as we can and as, as we need. So we have to use the expertise of the government and we use also evaluation programs that are organized jointly with the government to evaluate the status of our project. Uh, that is also important for uh, institutionalizing our uh, activities that we have implemented and handed over to the communities. One of the methods that we use is uh, uh, signing of memorandum of understanding and the developing exit strategy, because on these roles and responsibilities, we put roles and responsibilities on, on these MOUs that we sign mutually. And at the, at the end of the day, we introduce the exit strategy as a binding rule for every partner to, to, to play its own part. And recognizing local clan and religious leaders is so important and so because these people are so influential, they are the gateway to the communities and to the resources the communities have. So in the course of implementing a project, uh, building trust is very important with the community, opinion leaders, a donor and uh, the government. The second, the second lesson that we have learned is flexibility. Communities have their own concerns. It's not that we have a project for three years, for example, and we have to stick that uh, guideline and budget. No, sometimes in a place like Afar, for example, where drought is a common phenomenon that comes every time, we have to shift our, your, your project activities into you know, emergency programs as needed. So we have to be flexible for that. The challenge is, Donors sometimes are restrictive in changing activities and uh, restrictions on funding can make this more challenging. So flexibility is very important. The third lesson that we have learned is we don't have to duplicate. We don't have to copy paste activities. We have to see the, co the context on the ground, even in the same region where we, you implement, even within a particular community, there might be a variation depending on the context of the area and the living condition of the people. So it might not be bad to copy an idea, but it's not about copying 
uh, and pesting projects, which is which brings risks. So in every project that we implement, that we have learned it, we have to respect the needs and rights of the people. We don't have to impose our needs as 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 people who know the needs of the people. Finally, my recommendations are: uh, we have to put. I mean, uh, we have to put. In every project, we have to put the issue of sustainability at the beginning, and we have to discuss about it from, it should grow from the planning and the inception period and implementation and monitoring with local partners. We have to establish, because it's a must that we have to establish, uh, that already we have an established accountability line with government and donors. It should also be there with our local uh, uh, clients. And finally, I would like to urge, I mean, as a recommendation to NGOs in Africa, because uh, aid is becoming a top-down uh, channel thing that's coming to Africa. So it's better to uh, uh, advocate on localization of uh, aid, I mean, for local NGOs to implement their projects really depending on the context. Thank you so much. Um Thank you. Wonderful, Ms. Russia. We're going to hold questions until we get to the end of the block of, of presenters. So, um, Anastasia, I, you'll, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yes. Um, Ms. Russia, do you want to um, clarify again the way you were looking at sustainability? Because it's not sustainability of your organization, but sustainability of the use of the projects after they are complete, completed. And do you want to also share like one example that helps us understand one of those lessons that you were talking about. You had a lot of this in your in your write up. Uh, Anastasia, yeah. let's um, can Masrasha, let's um, take let's wait until the end until the other presenters mm -hmm. and then let's come mm -hmm. back to Anastasia's okay. wonderful question. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think next we have um, uh, Janet. Um, uh, Janet, are you ready? And Masrasha, yeah. I think you have to stop sharing your screen. Oh. Wonderful. Thank Sorry. you, Masrasha. No, no, no problem. Terrific presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Janet? Thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you. And good afternoon and maybe good evening for some other people, depending on where you are. My name is Janet Mawio. I'm the executive director for the Kenya Community Development Foundation, KCDF. A 17 year, um, no, a 24 year old foundation uh, that promotes sustainable development of communities. The topic of my conversation is actually a non-profit's journey towards uh, seeking financial liberation. And I'll be picking experiences from, from KCDF. Uh, the format of my presentation um, is, is to actually cover um, uh, five different areas. Why financial sustainability? Um, or why is that important? What is the CSO context in Kenya where this is happening? And then I'll go ahead to discuss some income diversification strategies um, before moving on to do to kind of come up with the emerging lessons and challenges that have arisen from that work. And finally, I'll be asking: Is it is actually that liberation, that diversification, is it actually possible for NGOs? So very quickly, why this is a very important topic, um, as you may have picked even from listening to the previous fellows, a lot of nonprofits in Africa depend on external resources. The aid architecture, as we know it, has led to a situation where uh, donors fund specific programs. And so in the end, you end up giving budgets that are aligned towards the work that has been funded 
And that leaves very little flexibility for the organization to do other important things, whether it's a board retreat, whether it is uh, buying a server that an organization might need or a certain staff who is not a particular program staff for that particular funded work. Uh, and this has created a lot of uh, challenges, which is a life a lot of us have experienced. And it leaves a lot of nonprofits actually as contractors um, in terms of where they work, the work they do, uh, sort of being tied to what, what the funder wants. And we all know that a good, healthy organization must have um, all those other things taken care of. There's a lot of literature to support that. Um, people like uh, Edwards and Hume, Obadiah, even Ayn and Moyo, you know, they all talk about these challenges, which are not only specific to Kenya, but actually a lot of other NGOs in the continent. With respect to this particular context where this work has happened, as you have already gathered, um, that there's a huge diversity of civil society in Kenya. It's not homogeneous. There are those many we heard about who are you know, grassroots organizations, but there are also many other big and older organizations. There are multiple registration regimes. You can do NGO Act, you can do company, um, succession law. A lot of faith-based organizations get registered under the Society Act. There has been an effort to try and see if government could bring all this under one, one roof. And actually that is what was called or has been called the Public Benefits Organization Act. We popularly call it PBO. But that has never been commenced five uh, or six years later. So there is a, a, a civic space that has its own tensions with government and in a sense tightening. And just looking at one of the registration regimes, the NGO Act, just to give you an example of what we are talking about. Um, in 2018, 2019, they actually had over 11,000 NGOs registered. They received more than 1.5 billion and 88% of that was actually from international sources. So it just tells you how much dependency, and actually if you now take the other group, you can be sure that we are actually talking about uh, maybe over 90% of nonprofits depending on external funders. In the philanthropic space where KCDF operates from, we have a network of, uh, of actors. In their 2020 report, they actually uh, picked up about 113 funding actors and out of those 81 were in Kenya. And these granted out around $135 million, uh, out of which 73 were in Kenya again. So you could say Kenya has a real vibrant and growing civic space. Uh, but the big question is how do people, how do organizations get out of uh, depending on, on external funders? And I want to keep a very holistic view because we know an organization has core costs, it has operational or what you might call program costs. Uh, and I'm looking at it with four different eyes. When I look at the life of KCDF, where for the last uh, 24 years, we've actually tried to diversify our income. Um, and the first area I'll be looking at is how you can drive from inside. Secondly, how you can design your work for sustainability. Thirdly, how to communicate impact. And fourthly, building relationships. Um, wearing those lengths, that holistic length, um, I want to say that in the case of KCDF, we had an inspiration that came right from the, the, the startup when the foundation was formed. And um, that vision of, I remember one of our professors, Professor Abdallah telling me, Janet, we want to create a, our own thought foundation, you know? And because of that, that kind of inspired a spirit of, we must find ways of creating alternative resources. We can't remain, you know, in a situation we, where we can't do, or we can't give the money that communities need. And you could say from the very beginning, um, we had a scenario where one of the partners who are standing with us as the whole conversation of let's create a foundation was emerging, asked us, would you like to use an old refugee house? It used to be, a, it used to hold Ugandan refugees. Would you like to use that for your office or do you want to rent? And straight away, the founder said, let's go to that old refugee house and let's create an office out of it. 
The issue here around diversification is, is that over the years and right from the start, it allowed the foundation to leverage on office space as its own contribution. Because there are many funders who want to say, what are you putting on the table even as you come for your money? Of course, there are funders who will give you some rent money. And when they do, that can go or has gone into a saving. So we institutionalized a culture, a saving culture, a culture of going for value for money, making your money go as far as possible in anything that you are doing, building results, um, investing idle money. When you have money, but you know it will be used in another four or five months, you don't just keep it in the bank, you invest it but you are transparent about that kind of money. Uh, monetizing any services that you have as a, as a, that you can offer. Uh, there are people who need philanthropic support, either to corporates who want to think through their strategies or individuals who need OD support or whatever. At different times we have offered that, which are things that are aligned to our mission. Currently, one of our bigger areas of, of diversification has actually been to offer um, technology to NGOs. And this became very key when COVID came because the NGOs realized they actually need, need a technology to be able to survive and to continue doing their business. So from saving to building reserves, that led to a situation where we could establish an endowment. <clears throat> the second approach is actually designing programs for sustainability or designing work such that you, you have taken care of a sustainability angle. And uh, one of the hallmarks or hallmarks of KCDA is actually to promote community philanthropy, enabling people, engaging in such a way that communities are at the table, communities are on the driver's seat of their own development. Um, and so allowing them to bring, whether it is their networks, whatever assets they have, their knowledge, all that has been part of it. But as a foundation, we are from the one pushed a local giving, encouraging every single Kenyan in their different spaces to find ways of contributing towards those who are not so able or towards some of the challenges that we are experiencing. And so from community to middle income to high network, net worth people who would give, Dr. Shandaria, for example, has given us an amount of money every year in the last 10 years, though that is IN, but even companies. As we have pushed, we have seen many move from one-off giving to actually multi-year type of support. Incentifying giving as a way of mobilizing resources that can be used for programs, matching uh, whatever communities are doing and allowing them to just put in what they have. That actually led us to begin a program where we were matching for communities who are tired of, of um, doing endless fundraising create community endowment funds, which they then, uh, you know, were able to invest within our own endowment. So we could say this approach, what it does is to encourage, rebuild or revamp the confidence of people or help them regain their confidence to move development processes. I must say, when you set up an endowment, you have to think about ways of how to manage it. And it is within that that we had to look around in our own environment and find out how, what is the legal framework that can help us hold uh, a, a collection of money that is for a common good. And we had to establish a trust, meaning we had to register something under a different law from the one the foundation is registered. The foundation is a company limited by guarantee. The trust is under the, the law of succession. Janet, so there had to, Janet, you have about two minutes left. Okay. So uh, in other words, there had to be a way to manage the endowment, put all the systems in place uh, and have a way of en ensuring that it communicates confidence. And the third approach is actually communicating the impact. And um, as commercial is actually to stop, just showing what is the difference, helping communities appreciate the difference we are making and the difference different grassroots organizations who are getting uh, grants from us are making. So that allows people to see why you are important. Moving on, um, we actually, a thought strategy was um, at our 10th anniversary. The strategy I'm talking about is actually building relationships. At the 10th anniversary, AKF said, we, you can actually, we can transfer this building to you because we have seen you are serious. So deepening relationships began to uh, bear some fruit. 
Another one, uh, later on, around two or six, we got a matching fund, actually from the Ford Foundation, where they were willing to give us three million if we raised three million. If we had not built that culture of giving, we would not have been able to, uh, to raise a matching fund. In 2011, again, the, the power of relationships, one afternoon sitting in my office, half a million dollars was confirmed, which we had never requested for from a fund, actually Rockefeller, that's what I'm calling RF. And so I'm just saying we have found a lot of power in investing in building relationships as a very serious way of diversifying. And later on, um, we've been able to create another investment company with a partner. What are the lessons that we have emerged? And the one big question or the one big lesson is that if you are, once you get into different in um, diversified portfolio, you have to find an effective way of managing that. And that is how we have created a new company that is now help, helping us to manage the assets. We've, I, we can say mission drift can be real if not taken care of. Different skills are required for different investments if you put those in place. There may be other cultures of, other, of some of the people where you invest money. And the important thing I'm taking away from the fellowship is the importance of formalizing harding and negotiation spaces so that you are able to make sure the investment side and the social side are communicating and are still emotionally connected. Is um, it possible for a nonprofit to build? I can confidently say it is. We've done it. It's a journey. Others will jump in and support you if you are willing to make that. You have to be credible. You have to communicate. And um, just to wind up, um, the words of Greg Mills, I find very inspiring. You can't have a long-term institution without investing in governance as a continuing concern. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're running a little bit behind and, and thank you for a wonderful presentation, Janet. We're gonna um, hold off questions again and we're gonna move on to our next presenter, Ronnie. Wonderful, thank you, Ronnie. Yep, we're, we're, your screen is coming up. I think you're on mute, Ronnie. Yeah, I'll be talking about, thank you very much for that introduction. I'll be talking about towards strengthening downward accountability, the experience of Namibia Development Trust and the implications for the NGO practice. I'm Ronnie Tempers, the executive director of Namibia Development Trust. This is what I'll be talking about briefly. Um, to start with the Namibian story, Namibia is the last African country to have gained independence we are a multi-party democracy that fulfills most democratic norms. Key things to say is that we are ranked first in Africa for press freedom since 2019. According to Civicus report, we are qualified, our civic space is qualified as a narrowing civic, civic space. And in terms of the civil society index of Namibia, it is at 4.3, which means that the civil society sustainability is under pressure. Namibia Development Trust was founded in 1987. And our vision is that we want to see self-reliant community-based organizations. Our mission is to strengthen community-based organizations through training and mentoring. The kind of organizations that we work with is conservancies. We have got in Namibia about 86 conservancies. Now a conservancy is formed by communities living in the same ge geographical area. And through that formation of a conservancy, they get rights over wildlife and tourism. We provide institutional governance support to these 86 conservancies and we co coordinate that portfolio. And we also work with an organization called Namibia Rural Women Assembly that's an advocacy body and it has got 14 regional chapters in Namibia. Key, key partnership that is important to this discussion is NAXO. There is the Namibian Association for supporting community-based natural resource management. And that is the association that is coordinating the support towards conservancies. 
accountability, uh, some key definition of issues. Those of you who are following the discourse on accountability will probably agree with me that there's no common definition, but this one has come closer to what I want to say today. Accountability is defined as the process through which an organization actively creates and formally structures balanced relationships with its diverse stakeholders, empowering this to hold it to account over its decisions, activities, and impacts with a view to continuously improve the organization's delivery against its mission. There are different types of accountability, but our preoccupation today is downward accountability. Downward accountability refers to accountability to beneficiaries. But key short shortcoming that has been highlighted in literature is that current accountability is still much focused on upward um, accountability. And that has been the issue that we have been addressing. And part of our capacity building has taught us that key lessons that we can highlight here is that having a CBO on the ground that has got the capacity is an essential ingredient for realizing downward accountability. I agree with literature that says that downward accountability must be towards the co communities on the ground. But having that entity on the ground that has got the necessary capacity is an ingredient that is, that is very much vital. Once you have got that, community-based organization on the ground, it can, then you can help strengthen that CBO and that helps to, because that CBO is now well-managed, that CBO can contribute towards improving livelihoods here. But also the other preoccupation that I've got as part of this discussion to, is to say, in Namibia, we have now created these uh, CBOs with the necessary capacity. Can we use these CBOs as the basis to contribute towards a bottom-up development for self regulation in Namibia. And I'll come back to this much later in my slides. The, when I looked at the different offers, they, they also talked about different benefits and challenges that downward accountability brings. In terms of benefits, downward accountability has got the possibility to promote ownership of the development process. It provides shifts between NGOs, community-based organizations, and donors. It provides greater legitimacy and sustainability for NGOs, which is a key question that we are addressing currently, and also contributes towards localizing of development agenda. We'll deal with the challenges in the next slide. Some of the challenges that has been identified by different offers is that one of the challenges is that there's a need for stakeholders to have equal rights. And how we are approaching as NDT this question is, we help CBOs as part of our capacity building to be registered with the state. We also sign what is called a memorandum of understanding, and that clarifies the roles and responsibilities between us as an NGO and the community-based organization. And because these CBOs have got capacity now, they can also enter into agreements with private sector. Challenge two that literature has highlighted is that there's a lack of a model for NGOs to be accountable in theory and practice with the communities that it is supporting. What we are saying, the way that we're approaching in entities that we facilitate participatory needs assessment processes, which leads to CBO purpose and vision clarification action plan development. And that helps to set and cast the vision by the community to say, this is what they want to achieve and what support will they need. The third challenge that is identified by literature is to say, communities generally do have nothing to offer in terms of resources. We are quite disturbed by this uh, statement by communities because we believe and from our experience that communities bring so much to the process, social capital that they bring, even if they don't have income, wisdom, knowledge, et cetera. And that is the social capital that we are talking about. But also in our case, CBOs have started generating own income, which I'll just try to show now. And that helps them to cover their costs. So there's quite a lot that they bring. Also, the, another challenge is that CBOs may be less uh, talk about in, in cases they don't like NGO support because they may lose support if they talk against an NGO. Our experience tells us that, and even this case study is built on a case where a CBO community is asking and questioning uh, entity budget because our services were included as part of the budget because they got funding from the donor to say, what are you going to provide? Why should we pay you this, this amount of money? And that discussion was a very fundamental basis for us to develop this discussion. For example, this is just a slide that shows you that the kind of conservancies that we are working with, we're able to generate about 100, 150 million Namibian dollars. One US dollars equals 15 Namibian dollars. You can do the maths and see what that, what that brings. But also CBOs, they are 
quite a number of figures here, but for example, we have got 5,178 jobs that CBOs create. That is quite a significant income that conservancies were able to contribute because of the kind of uh, sustainable hunting that they do, and also the kind of livelihoods that they can provide to their communities. As, as a result of our work, we have seen shifting accountabilities. Roles are shifting and changing. The first process is NGOs are building the capacity of CBOs. Because of this capacity now, CBOs are able to access direct donor funding. CBOs have been able to generate own income and that has created in CBOs now being able to say, we can directly contract NGOs to be able to provide. So suddenly we have got a situation where CBOs have got the capacity, now we have to provide services. We have to send our invoices to them, even in some cases where donors are paying for that service, but CBO has got the authority to say, we don't like your service, you need still to do this, etc. And this has been an interesting scenario for us and it has certainly a changing thing. But I think one thing that I want to caution here is that although we like the scenario that because of the capacity that is there, donors are starting to support CBOs, we don't want to see a situation where these CBOs will be forced up into an upward accountability mode and thus taking them away from their core mandate, which is their local members and local constituency. We also know that although CBOs are getting this direct funding, they still depend on NGOs and NGOs are picking up quite a, quite a, quite a load here. Finally, I want to say that for downward accountability, our experience and the kind of shifts that we have seen says that we need Upward accountability is much easier because there you just need an NGO with the skill sets. Reports have to be submitted, uh, finances have to be done on time, etc. But social downward accountability requires other kinds of skills. NGO must be ready to share their power with the CBO. NGO, NGO must open itself up to the CBO. And those are the kind of traits that are, that are, that are needed. So CBO and NGO for downward accountability to happen needs to have the capacity, both the financial capital and the social capital. When this works together, I think we are better off to be able to promote sustainable uh, or downward ac ac accountability. But also it is, it, is, it is important to say that downward accountability, the benefits that we have seen is that it creates CBO members who have got the ability because of the work that entity together with other partners in the community-based natural resource management sector has been doing. CBO members have been educated about their rights and responsibilities. So CBO members are now able to hold their leaders accountable. CBO leader members are now able to ask the right questions to their members. And through this, we are cu cultivating a democratization culture in Namibia, in these communities. And I think this adds to the whole active citizenry. And as I've said at the beginning, we are talking about a narrowing civic space and through downward accountability, we are contributing towards building and strengthening that civil society voice and strength of civil society to be able to drive local de development agenda. But also we believe that downward accountability requires donors that are willing to come to the table to be able to say what kind of local development agenda needs to be supported. And as I was saying at the beginning, Part of my interest through this discussion is to say, how can we use the capacity that has been used, that has been built over years in amongst the CBOs to work towards between NGOs and CBOs, a self-regulatory framework that can best manage the re relationship between NGOs and CBOs. We have seen that in Namibia, we have started with this process some 10 years back, but this process has been stalled for, for, for some time. But we also believe that part of this process is aimed really at, um, we need to strengthen NGO accountability broadly. But I think we are talking about downward accountability. And for me, downward accountability at the end must improve livelihoods. It needs to do that. And that is why it is, it is important to talk about this subject Basically, it needs to improve livelihoods on the ground. It's not just a fashion for us to do it, but we need to see the change on the ground. I Ronnie? thank you for your attention. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> perfect timing. Um, thank you, wonderful, Ronnie. Um, so our last presenter in this block of time is Keenan. Um, and so uh, Keenan, and then Ronnie, you'll just need to um, unshare your screen there. Yep. 
And I can see the questions going in the chat, which is really lovely. So we will get those um, once Keenan is, is done. So Keenan, are you, are you there? Ah, great, wonderful. Okay, terrific, thank you. Over to you, Keenan. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Kenan Ngambi, proudly Zambian, a son of the soul of Africa. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, slideshow. Just for the week, I'm putting on slideshow. I think you can also do it from the bottom if you want to on the right hand yeah. side. Right hand side. Um, near the, yep. Near the volume, yeah, I don't know. If, nope, not that one. The sorry, the one that has a little. It's next to the four boxes. It's kind of hard to see. Or you can go from the top. I think under um, view. Oh, you got it. Okay, terrific. Okay, my okay. Thank you so much. My title of uh, my presentation is formalization as a tool to community accountability for voluntary asso associations, a case of private community health organization. So like I said, my name is Kenan Ngambi. I am the executive director of Pride Community Health Organization in a town called Kafiwe in Zambia. I've been the executive director for the last 10 years. So my, the, uh, my presentation outlook is, first, I'll talk about organizational overview, then organizational challenge, leading for change, reflections, and then conclusion. So Pride Community Health Organization was founded in 2004 as a support group of, for people living with HIV and AIDS in Zambia. I am HIV positive, I've lived with HIV for the last 20 years. In the same year, the government started an aggressive treatment program for antiretroviral drugs. At this, at this particular time, my wife died in my arms from HIV related stigma. Then organization established to address issues that hindered access to new treatment pro programs. So in this, uh, in the 2004, it was very difficult to access treatment because the drugs were very, very expensive. And also there was a lot of stigma and discrimination uh, towards people that were uh, testing HIV uh, positive. So we transitioned to a nonprofit organization providing HIV and sexual reproductive health information and services in 2010. And currently we are implementing programs in seven of 17 wards of Kafir district. So the initial main aim of the support group was to improve the quality of lives for people living with HIV and AIDS. Like I said, it was very difficult to interact with people in the community. They looked at you like um, you were going to die. So we needed to find ways and means of uh, interacting among, amongst ourselves. So the support group was, uh, 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 has normally a membership of between 10 to 20 individuals. So I took a decision to, I'm the founder of the organization. I took a decision to come out in the open and um, uh, 11 other uh, colleagues of mine joined me in this, uh, when we established the support group in 2004. So these groups are led by a coordinator, and I was a coordinator at that time, but he and, or she does not have absolute power or authority to make decisions. So these groups have one person, one vote, the principle that members have equal representation in voting. So this type of decision-making process can be abused, abused if not checked. What do I mean by this? Uh, I'm saying if there's blind royalty, 
you find that people vote according to what they are detected to, to do in the, in the support group. So sometimes those decisions can be uh, uh, devastating to, to, to things that you want to do in the community. So limited resources to meet uh, some of the, this, that's what, yeah. Organizational challenge, limited, we had limited resources uh, to meet some of the committee challenges that members encountered on a day-to-day -day basis, such as taking care of, of the welfare of members. Secondly, we had internal conflicts that oftentimes created strife amongst the membership because of little, little resources that we had and the, the kind of um, gov governing structure that we had, we had a lot of um, conflicts. Then the informal status and lack of good governance structures in the organization made it difficult to, to meet mission and ensure accountability to the community. So at some point, donors also began to refuse to support our work. Next slide. So, I began to, uh, the challenge that uh, arose, I began to seriously entertain the idea of putting in place a governing body, a board that would oversee the transition to non-government organization and ultimately increase accountability in the organization. So I encountered a lot of internal resistance from the, uh, the 11 founding members uh, of the support group to formalize the, uh, the organization. This resistance increased internal conflicts, which in turn affected the operations of the organization in terms of fulfilling our mission of the support group, uh, support group at that time and to the community. Next slide. So leading for change, what did I do? I took a personal decision. I called a meeting with external stakeholders, including the community. The community supported the transition to a non-profit organization. So what, what do I mean by this? Uh, since we were very accountable uh, and transparent to the community, they understood what we were aiming to do in the community. Though they knew that I had in, um, internal resistance from my members, when I approached the community, some of them, the beneficiaries, I, I saw the idea that we needed to formalize the organization to bring in uh, good governance uh, systems. So the community put in place a, commit, a commit, committee of influential individuals who had no direct affiliation to the group to recruit outside board members. Then the committee conducted a very independent recruitment exercise by placing adverts in selected public places. So the, when they did that, a new board, uh, they recruited board members. At first they were 10, but they reduced to, to six after scrutinizing the list of um, the, the applicants in the community. So what, what are my reflections in this process? Practices such as governance, ethics, policies, financial transparency, internal controls and regulations to demonstrate accountability are most inadequate or non-existent in most uh, non-profit organizations in Africa. It is also evident that non-profit boards play a critical role in establishing and maintaining public trust. Thirdly, it must be acknowledged that, that, that sometimes resistance can be a valuable resource in the accomplishment of change in an organization. Accessing its benefits, however, requires a shift in leaders' tendency to, to blame resistance for the failure of change. So what, what do I mean here? I, um, I looked at um, uh, what, what was my contribution in trying to change the, um, the outcomes of, um, of this support group. And I found out that uh, I needed also to, to interact with my colleagues that were resisting the change. I needed to explain to them why and why I was insisting on um, uh, changing the governance system of the support group and why it would be beneficial for us to become a nonprofit organization. Next slide. So conclusion, accountability is not simply about formalization, but it is more deeply linked to organization purpose and public trust. Secondly, it is ex extremely important that nonprofit leaders pay greater attention to commit driven forms of accountability that could facilitate the achievement of, of organizational uh, missions. So what have been the benefits for us from moving from a support group to a nonprofit organization today? 
since we uh, transitioned to a nonprofit organization in 2010, we have accessed funding from 16 funders since 2010. We increased our funding from 10,000 US dollars in 2004 to $100,000 as I speak today. And again, the board has been able to help us uh, come up with uh, systems uh, that have made the, um, our funders become uh, confident in giving us resources. What do I mean by that? We have uh, uh, policies that are effect effective. We have uh, a board that is um, very effective. And uh, uh, I want to mention to you that when we were transitioning from a support group to um, a nonprofit organization, the board recruited, uh, they placed an advocate in, uh, in the committee for the chief executive officer. They did not look at me as the founding, as a founder. I had to go, uh, go through a process where they had to interview me, why I wanted to become the uh, chief executive officer. So I went through a, a vigorous um, uh, interview and luckily I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I, was, I was chosen. So you can see, I, I put aside the founder syndrome. I, I, I volunteered to uh, cede power to, to, the board, to the board members. So at any time they can fire me. Uh, that's why I applied for this um, uh, program that I, when, I, I, when I go back, I put in a, a transitional uh, program. Uh, when I leave, I leave behind me systems that will take this organization to another level where somebody can come up with better ideas than I have. So thank you so much. Thank you, Keenan. Thank you very much. Um, so we had a, a fantastic, another fantastic group of, of presenters, um, Nasresha, Janet, Ronnie, and Keenan. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the questions that came up um, in the chat. And I know, Anastasia, you also raised a question, but let me start with the ones in the chat. So the first question is um, for Masresha. Um, from Ahmed, who says um, they like the localization agenda. How are you reconciling organizational sustainability to project level sustainability? The reason being, I think once sustainability is institutionalized within an organization, it is easier to work towards project level sustainability, like some of the ideas from Janet. Masresha, did you wanna um, yeah. respond to that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Actually, there are three questions that I have seen. One is from Anastasia, the other from Grace, and the last one is Ahmed. Yeah. So I will respond for each of them. So I, uh, Anastasia's question was in, on elaborating the issue of sustainability, because sustainability, when we talk about sustainability in the NGO sector, it's about either an organizational sustainability or the sustainability of projects that we leave behind for the communities at the end of handing over the project to the communities. So my agenda on this presentation was on the sustainability of the projects that we implement and at the end of the project that we handed over to the communities. So uh, when it comes to Grace's idea, Grace asked an example of successful exit strategy is uh, there is one project that we implemented in West, Northwestern Afar uh, in district called Golina and particularly in uh, Wanasa, there was a hand, uh, I mean, there was a, a borehole that was functioning with the help of a generator, but there was no maintenance, there was no battery communities because in the middle of the desert, they were unable to maintain all these things. And they have a very good underground water, but they were not able to use from that. So our idea was to, put to change the solar, the, the generator into solar uh, assisted uh, power supply for the communities to use it sustainably. Our idea was only for drinking water, but gradually communities found out that because of the supply of the good supply of water from the, from the, from the source, they started to use for agricultural purposes. So our exit strategy had Three, four components. The first one is signing an agreement between the communities, the user associations, the government, and ISDA, where each of us having our roles and responsibilities 
on this project at the end of the day. That was one thing that we use as an exit strategy. The second one is establishing user associations because it's known that everybody can have, I mean, uh, a power over that source. We selected specific committee members who can manage the, the facility for the communities in terms of collecting money or protecting the, the facilities from any danger. The third one is the responsibility of the government to institutionalize these water sources into the government system where if there is anything needed any other time, either it could be maintenance or whatever, or expanding the project, it's left to the government. Even if there are other NGOs interested to expand this, the government is the responsible body to discuss that issue with, with, with us other NGOs. So ISTA's role and responsibility is handing over the project fully and also giving technical assist, assistance any time because we have other projects going on around there. So that was the essence of you know, exit strategy when I say exit strategy. Ahmed's question is how we can reconcile uh, organizational sustainability and the project sustainability. Yes, uh, project sustainability is a contributing factor for your organizational sustainability. It's not the only one, but if you have a very good ground on the, uh, uh, with, with the communities, with the government, with your donors, that you are putting sustainability at the front of your project and you are showing that your organization needs to sustain because your donors will, you can retain your donors because of that. You can, because the, the community start to talk about you or they accept you anytime you come up with any other project and the government also the decisive part of this partnership that also have a power to avoid you or to work with you. So it's a contributive. So it's, we have to reconcile both sustainability issues on the ground. Thank you for have answered those questions. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Risha. I think looking at the time, I see, let's take one more question. Um, there's so many, it's a shame that we don't have more time because these are such fantastic presentations. I see a question for Ronnie and we'll take this question and then we will take a break because we want to give everyone a chance to stretch for five minutes and we will come back um, to hear from our final block of presenters. And the question is from Hilma from uh, to Ronnie, as a part of downward accountability, a CBO uh, may choose to suspend support from an NGO to another. Um, have you had any experience of this? And is there a possibility of conflicts arising between different support NGOs? Himla, I don't know if I, I answer, if I uh, asked that question uh, in the way that you wanted. Yes, you did, thank you. Okay. Ronnie, did you want to respond to that? Yes. Yes, thanks very much, Hilma, for that for that question. Yes, we, we have we have come across that experience in the Namibian CBNRM program and in the sector. And I think we need to recognize that CBOs, as we build capacity, are maturing. And as CBOs are maturing, they will require different levels of support. And NGOs need to be flexible. For example, in Namibia, we have got what I called about, talked about NAXO. That's the association that coordinates service provision to CBOs. And to, to avoid that, uh, I mean, to, to, to ensure that support is coordinated. But we need to recognize that CBOs are growing and NGOs need to give the flexibility to C CBOs to be able to choose whom they need to choose for providing support services for them. Different growth stages requires different support. Maybe a CBO at the beginning just needs milk. As they grow, they may need meat. As they grow, they may need bones. And if an NGO cannot provide those things at one given stage, it needs to go, give way and give the freedom. Capacity means, if CBO says, we have got the capacity, you need to ensure that means CBO has got the choice that they can make about which service need to provide. That is why I am offering the, as part of the downward accountability and strengthening NGO accountability that the discussion around NGOs needs to engage CBOs to say, what support services do you need? What, how do you feel about the kind of support services that we provide to you? What needs to change? What needs to stay the same? And I think in that way, annually assessing that will help NGOs to be able to provide appropriate support. But we also need to ensure that CBOs are led by people that bears the interest of the community. We, literature also talks about elite cap, cap, capture. That's why I talked about social capital that is needed. Social capital, one of the important factors is, is the 
integrity in that CBO from the people that are leading that. And if that is based on integrity, for example, the choices that they're making, fair and good, CBO should have the right to choose whom they want to work with. Thank you. Even if they create conflicts amongst NGOs. Great. I think there's probably a follow-up question there. That's thank you very much, Ronnie. And so what I want to suggest is there's a question also for Janet, and I want to um, uh, you know, give Janet a, a chance to respond to that. Um, and if people need to stretch, they can. We were going to start the next set of presentations at 10 after, but let me, for those of you that are able to stay and hear Janet's response, the question, Janet, um, is uh, in developing your proposal for support, how do you build in organizational sustainability without appearing bloating or padding your cost lines? Yeah, maybe I should clarify that uh, the section that I really discussed today is really the diversification strategies, not so much the core cost of KCDF. The core costs of KCDF are completely separate. They are actually kept at a very low figure because each of these entities have to pay for their own running costs. When you manage a building, it must pay for its service provider, who is a property manager. The endowment must pay the service provider, the fund managers, et cetera. So every investment must pay for its own cost. So not, that has nothing to do with the organizational cost. So this is purely an arm that is supporting the organization to have resources for its costs, but we actually keep our costs at a, at a very low level. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Janet. I will just ask um, the audience members to, to keep putting their questions in the chat. So we will come back and start right promptly at, at 110 since we're running a little bit behind. So you get a, a four minute break, everyone stretch and, and we'll see you in a couple minutes. <laughs> 